in Hunterdon County, uh, 16 miles of beautiful sort of landscape. And I mentioned, this is the trail that I mentioned two weeks ago that my son and I almost had an encounter with a bear and her cubs. But Dave and I would meet there once a week early in the morning to talk and pray. And so one morning, Dave and I are on this trail. And we're talking and, he, and we're praying. And he looked at me and he asked me a question that kind of shook me a little bit. He looked at me and he said, are you legitimate? Now, I love questions that cause me to think. I love asking questions that cause us and to be a recipient of questions. There are so many times we are engaged in dialogue with people where it's just a continual back and forth where we really, you get a question that kind of staggers you a little bit. Like, wait, what exactly does he mean? But I knew what he meant when he asked me, are you legitimate? You see, we were two men that would walk this trail and talk about our relationship with the living God. Talk about an understanding that we had a relationship with the living God only because of Jesus. And that this relationship with God wasn't simply about something we do. It was about the Holy Spirit inhabiting our body and changing us from the inside out. Changing us into the image of Jesus as we're his hands and feet along the way. The image of the living God as we're being changed into as a husband. As the call of a husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. And it's my role and responsibility to build my wife up, God's daughter, and present her as holy. As a father of a son and a daughter, to raise them up in the world we live in against the flow, in a way that God would have me raise them, in the relationships with the people around me. The question was, is this something we do? Are you le- is this being realized? Legitimate means being re- is real. Is the truth of who God is and the call on my life being realized? Is it real? Is it being fleshed out in the day-to-day of my life? That's what that question was all about. And the reason that question staggered me, because I don't always feel legitimate. There are times, quite frankly, I feel like a boy in a man's body. There are times I feel ill-equipped and unqualified. But thanks be to God that what I feel are not determining factors on why he chooses us. It's not about what I feel and what I think. And at times, that feeling of not feeling or thinking we're legitimate are lies from the adversary. Because he's the father of lies. But I also believe believe it lies in confusion of who God is and what the real call on our life is. And so what I'd like to do, and we are going to look at a lot of scripture in a short amount of time is to look at the call. We have been on this road called the journey to the cross. As Jesus was born and we looked at one week at Jesus as a divine infant. And when people, before he said a word, people were like, whoa. Two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' journey into the wilderness where he had an interaction with the adversary. And today, we are going to look at Jesus' call on human beings, flesh and blood like you and me, where he said two words, follow me, and their response. And we're going to begin in John chapter 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew, 
Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Joseph. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. Then he added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jump over to Mark, chapter 1, verse 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is amazing. These people, milling around, navigating through the day-to-day -day of their life, and Jesus, the Son of God, comes to them and says, follow me. There's little more information, right? He didn't say where he was going. He didn't say for how long. And they picked up and they followed. Who would do that? When the two start walking and Jesus turns around and sees them following him, and he says, what do you want? Great comeback. Where are you staying? What's his response? Follow me. No details. Just the call to follow. Why was their response so dramatic? One of the great things about the Bible is really when we read the Bible is understanding the culture and the time that this was all happening. I can't, and I've said this ad nauseum, but it must have been amazing to be on this earth when Jesus was walking. Right? It must have been amazing, even from afar, to catch a glimpse of God in flesh on earth. The Bible says that when he taught, he taught like uh, uh, another, uh, not like other teachers of the law, because he taught with authority. And then to see him touching and feeding and healing and opening eyes, raising people from the dead, casting out demons, it must have been amazing. But if you were living during this time and you were Jewish, it was common to have rabbis who taught and, and tell stories that were impressive and enticing and appealing. And if you wanted to be mentored, which was not uncommon in the Jewish faith, if you wanted to be mentored by one of these rabbis, it was your responsibility to pursue the rabbi. And so to pursue them with this sort of idea that you could become a mentor of them, that you could sit under their leadership. And more often than not, even if you pursued them and asked them to be their mentor, they would probably say no, because only a few were chosen. Jesus in this culture flipped the switch. Jesus flipped the script because he didn't wait for them to ask him. He initiated the relationship. He said to them, you, unschooled, ordinary man, follow me. If that doesn't get your attention, when the living God calls you by name and says, follow me, I'm not sure what will. In John 15, chapter 15, it says, I no longer call you servants, 
Because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Are we in agreement today that you didn't choose God? He chose you to follow him. It was God alone that chose to write the relationship. This begins with an understanding that you and I, while created in the image of the living God, and created to have a relationship with him, created to have a relationship where his Holy Spirit would change us from the inside out, that he would make us into the image of Jesus, that we might be his hands and feet along the way, while knowing that's why we exist and we breathe today, to walk with the living God, that we were born as enemies to God. We were born separated from God because we were enslaved in our sin. That created a chasm and a distance between us and God that could not be crossed by mankind. There's nothing you can do to earn this. It was God who initiated writing the relationship. It was God who said, I'm going to write the relationship as an act of what love? That our God is a holy God, but our God is a loving God. And he said, I'm going to write the relationship. While we're yet, still yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's a demonstration of his love. That he righted the relationship. He initiated the relationship with you. How awesome is that? Now, what's amazing, when you read, I read the Bible through chronological order, and I'm in the Gospels now, and I read it with a little bit of pace to it, and it's amazing how many people are following Jesus. It's not like nobody's, it's not like he had to build a crowd. When Jesus was on this earth, there were crowds that were forming, that were following, that were trying to run and get ahead of him, so that when he landed or got to a certain place, they'd already be there. But yet he identified very specific people, not just simply to follow him from afar, but to build an intimate relationship. And that's what he's called you to. Not a relationship that's from afar, but an intimate relationship with him. Can you imagine what the disciples saw if you go to Mark chapter 4? Mark chapter 4, verse 35, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. The wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. How often are you with God? Where you see him in a way where you go, who is this? Wow! The scriptures say all dominion and all belong to him. This intimate relationship isn't about Jesus bringing in people close simply to, to see what he's doing. What he's doing is a reflection of who he is. They're intertwined, what he's doing and his power. How often do we position ourselves to see the power of the living God in ways that are unmistakably him? This week I had a privilege and an opportunity to sit with a woman who's 83 years old. And she's been deemed not long for this earth. Now I say that knowing that there isn't a soul in this room that knows how many days are ordained for us. But this woman was on hospice. And sort of there is a little bit of an uncertainty of what sort of relationship this woman had with the living God. And there's a little bit of a concern, for lack of a better word, from the family who are believers sort of wrestling with knowing that when we take our last breath, the scriptures indicate, if we don't have, I'm not talking about believing in God. Even the demons believe in shudder. I'm talking about having a relationship with the living God through Jesus. And so I went to go 
pray for this woman. And for me as a human being, there is nothing more from a flesh perspective more intimidating than going and sitting before somebody to have a dialogue about Jesus and eternity, knowing that they may only have hours or days on this earth. Also knowing that I don't have an ability to save anybody, but that God has a role and responsibility for us to be a witness. And so as I sat bedside, and I was on a chair that had wheels on it, and I wheeled as close as I could to this woman, because her talk was sort of muffled because she was on a breathing apparatus, and she was catching her breath as, as we talked. And we sort of, it was the first real conversation that I had with this woman. And so we kind of talked about her and her life, and she told me about an experience that she had. She had been battling illness for a period of time now, and she kind of realized that the, her end is coming. And she talked about having a life that was a good life, but she could identify that she had regrets. That she knew that she had fallen short. And she told me about experiences she had. She recently was in the hospital. And she told me that she had an experience where she said, this is what she told me. She said, I'm in the hospital laying in my bed, and I opened my eyes, and standing next, she felt a, show, a hand on her shoulder. And she said to me, I looked, and I believed that what I was looking at was Jesus. And so she's telling me this story, and so after she's telling me this story, I asked her the question, I said, why do you think Jesus would come to you? And she said, I think Jesus came to help me. And after she kind of navigated through what she meant by that, I said, Jesus did not come to help you. Jesus came to save you. And so as we were talking about what salvation was, I don't know if you've ever been, these are, there's only a handful of times in my life where I've been having a conversation with somebody about Jesus, and when I was talking about Jesus, I'm telling you, her eyes were almost looking through me. She was completely engaged in this conversation. And we talked about Jesus and about a relationship with the living God and how we were born, what I just talked about prior, as enemies to God. And while we were built to have a relationship with God, that it was only through Jesus. That the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that he is Lord, we will be saved. And it's more than just salvation that we put a ticket in our pocket so when we take our last breath, we can pass that ticket to him and say, let me in. It's about salvation, about healing. It's about victory, that by his wounds we are healed. We are saved in the immediate and a continual process of his saving us until we see him again in eternity when we take our last breath. And so as we're dialoguing about this back and forth, I said to her, all you need to do is at this point in your life is say yes. Yes, that you understand that you were born into sin. Yes, that you understand that there's no other way. And yes to Jesus. And so as we're about to end, all right, she, we're just talking back and forth, and I said, right, I'm going to pray. And normally I ask people who are probably about to leave the earth, are you ready to go or not? Do you want more? Like, what am I supposed to pray for here? And so I start to pray for her. I put my hand on her arm, and I start praying that, God, I believe this, he's the God that heals. I believe that he can restore her for another 10 or 20 years on this earth, not a doubt in my mind. And so I'm praying for healing for her. And all of a sudden, as I'm praying for healing, I hear the words whispered, yes. And I keep praying. She, didn't, she goes, yes, so to get my attention. And I open my eyes. She's staring right at me. I mean, like this close to me. And she says, I'm saying yes to Jesus. And I was like, how amazing. And the reason I said that is if you've ever been in the presence of somebody who says yes, that's a miracle. That's the supernatural power of God calling somebody into a relationship with the living God. You see, I saw God do something miraculous that day. That a soul was saved. How often are we people who position ourselves to see the power of the living God in the moment by moment of life? Because that's what he's called us to do. To be in a relationship where that power, first and foremost, is seen in here. Because it, 
it's going to take all that power to change his heart. But he's called us into a deep, personal, intimate relationship where you can see him, his power and his glory and his majesty. But it doesn't end there. The relation is extended. In Matthew chapter 10, imagine being the disciples and seeing all this. And then at one point, he calls them together and says, all right, now you guys go do it. Imagine that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Jane, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever, whenever a town or village you enter, search for someone wor some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. But be on your guard against the men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. <clears throat> Who's signing up for that? <laughs> Jesus says, here's this relationship. I'm extending my authority to you. Now go and do. Travel light, go in my name, and be prepared for persecution. And don't worry about it because that has nothing to do with you. It's my power that's doing the work. Listen, it doesn't end there. You might be like... That's not, oh, well, go to 1 Corinthians 12. Because if you have a relationship with the living God, it doesn't matter if you're 5 or 105. You've got a role in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, now about spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is the Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge, by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing, by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as what he determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. 
Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason to cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these par those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be what? No division in the body, but that his parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If you have a relationship with the living God through Jesus, this isn't about simply, which is in and of itself is amazing, enter a relationship with the, big, uh, the living God. You have entered a relationship with his church. You have a role in response. It says you're no longer ignorant. You can't say to God, I didn't know if you heard those words. You are now on notice. God has given you gifts to be part of the church. Gifts that he be manifested through for the common good of this body. Little C, big C. When I got married, I knew that as a husband, I had a role and responsibility in that marriage. When God blessed us with two children, 17 now, 17 and 19, I have a role and responsibility as a father. As a believer, you have a role and responsibility to his church. We as the American C have made this more of a staff-oriented organization than the body of Jesus. And so we've got work to do to become a body without division where we all see us in equality, that there is no gift that's greater than another and that we need each other. So that God could glorify himself so that we could be a light in a very dark community. This is part of the relationship that he has called us to. And as we start to wrap this up, any relationship that I've been involved in, there's been misstep along the way. There's been times in my relationships that I feel like I've failed. Or there's been setbacks along the way. This is a relationship that you will feel like at times you failed. But here's how amazing God is. Can you imagine Peter in John 21? John 21 is where the living God Jesus has an interacting with Peter. This story takes place after Jesus has risen from the grave. Jesus, toward the last moments of his life, was telling the disciples that he was leaving the earth, that he was going to die, that he was going somewhere where they couldn't follow. And Peter says, I'll follow you wherever you go. He says, prison or death, I'll go with you. And I'm paraphrasing here. Jesus says, you're going to go with me? You're going to deny me three times before this day is over. And unfortunately, that happens to Peter. Three times he denies knowing Jesus. Do you think in that moment Peter felt legitimate? This story picks up where Peter says to his disciples, I'm going fishing. Anyone want to come? I feel like they're like, what do we do now? 
We might as well go back to our old life. Let's go fishing. That's what we know. But it doesn't end there for Peter. Because God's a God that restores. In John 21, verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and, he, they, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, a burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When, he had finished e when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, I know that I, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. He didn't condemn him. He didn't parade him. I told you this was going to happen. You know what he said? Get up and follow me. Even in the midst of when you think you're failing. I mentioned two weeks ago, that 18 months ago, uh, I was approached by the district to uh, pursue this process of ordination. I mentioned that this is normally a two to three year process of having a mentor, uh, someone from the district who's been down this road, who sort of comes alongside you. And, and my mentor has been John Sofer, and what an amazing gift God has given me to have this man uh, walk with me through this process uh, of ordination. Through this process, you'd have to complete, I don't know if it's eight or nine modules. There, there are documents with questions about theology and doctrine and CMA and all this sort of stuff that you have to prepare for this ordination, which would culminate in a test which comes in two parts, a written component and a verbal component of this test. And so uh, the written test was on January 18th. And it said, it took me, you had eight hours to complete 50 questions. And it took me seven hours and 45 minutes to complete these questions. And I told you, people from this congregation were frustrated that I kept that test on the down low. I didn't tell anybody about it because I was afraid I was going to fail it. And there's all this I've mentioned before, I, I barely got through high school. It took me eight years to get a bachelor's degree because I was working, I got married early. I love to learn, but the system in which we sometimes have people learn, my brain doesn't fit well in that system. And so it's a lot of work to go through this process. And I took that test on January 18th, and God amazingly uh, passed through flying colors. And two weeks ago, I mentioned that my verbal, hold the applause, there's more to come. Um, I mentioned two weeks ago that on February 9th, I would have the uh, verbal component of this test. And I was approaching this test with fear and trepidation. 
Because while the written to me was, was intense, this would be more intense as I ha sit on a Zoom call with four men who are going to drill me, you know what, that, what I mean, with questions about theology and all the stuff that w I, I put on paper in this test. And so February 9th come, and I prepared for that time just uh, the same way as I prepared for the written uh, exam. And I, 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 it was a Zoom call, and so I was in the church, uh, and I, I was prepared for the Zoom call, and there were four men that came up, and this process started where they asked me questions about theology and doctrine. It was a give and take, and a give and take, and a give and take. But as this process started moving through, there was some sort of uneasiness about sort of my interaction with these men. And when we took a break, an hour and a half in, we took a break, and I sent my wife a text saying, this doesn't feel good. I, this isn't going good. There's something about this that doesn't feel right. And another hour and a half in, three and a half hours of back and forth sort of questions. And so they said, all right, we need to take some time, which is a normal sort of practice, and we're going to put you out of the Zoom, and we're going to come back with what, what our recommendations are. And so I'm sitting there and I'm texting my wife, this isn't good, this isn't good, this isn't good. And they come back and they say this. They said, we could end this process right here. But we're not. They said, we want more from you. And in that moment, I didn't say a word, because to be honest, I was angry. I was frustrated. I was embarrassed. Like, you know, I'm talking about my flesh. Like, what am I going to do now? I told everybody that this was, this, this was part of the process. And I felt good about it going in. What do I do? And I knew that I had a finance team meeting after that. I knew we had bridge. And people were going to be, how did it go? How did it go? How did it go? And I would have to stand before people. And they said, you're not done because we want more from you. Let me tell you something. I don't know where you are on your journey. It doesn't matter where you are, but God wants more from you. Amen. I want to be done with certain parts of this transition. We're not done. Listen, and the district has been amazing. They called me. They knew how I sort of, and I said nothing in response to that, but they called me two days after and said, relax. They're like, this is not uncommon. We just want more. But at times, I don't want to give more. Listen. God wants more from you. He wants more from us. And at times that means following him, we sang a song, wherever he wants you to go. Are you willing to go? Wherever. And it's not about doing more. He wants to do more. And the more he wants from you is to lean in. My last scripture is Philippians 3. Verse 10, for those of us that feel done with more. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. People, this journey is a journey to which we will know the power of the resurrection. The same power that conquered the grave wants to change us and make us into the image of Jesus from the inside out. And that is a road of crisis at times that he's going to call you down a road where he says, I want more. And he says, when you want more and you don't feel like it, you've got to grab on to that which is already grabbed onto you. Have you ever, sometimes my daughter's in the back, she's going to be annoyed, but sometimes my wife will come up to my daughter and just give her a bear hug. And sometimes my daughter will do one of these. Have you ever hugged somebody who doesn't want to hug you back? Yeah. I feel like that's God at times. God has said, I haven't just called you, I've taken hold of you. But if you want to know my power, you've got to grab on. Because when you do, when you move into the presence of the living God, you will see him in ways that are unmistakably him. Lord, I thank you that our experiences, our thoughts, and our feelings, again, aren't determining factors to how you see us. You see us as clean. You see us. 
Lord, you say that our sin in your sight, for those who believe in Jesus, as far as the east is from the west. You see us as, our, our, as your children. I pray that we become people who see ourselves as you see us and see those around us as you see them. That we'd be people when in times where we feel like we've failed or we don't want to go any further, that our response would be to lean into you and to watch you do what you do. And that's put yourself on display and save us and change us from the inside out that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name. So this next thing that we're going to do is a direct response to that. Stand with us if you wish. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Before, uh, before we pray this out, um, uh, just if you have any need for prayer, we have uh, some prayer warriors right over here in the corner that will help, help you connect. So, Father, thank you so much for this message this morning. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the challenge that you're giving us. Holy Spirit, help us with that challenge as we walk out of here today. In your son's name we pray this. Amen.